Welcome to First Federated Church's online video podcast of this week's sermon. First Federated Church is based out of Des Moines, Iowa. Please visit www.firstfederated.org for more information. How are you doing today? Good, good. I want to welcome you to the service. Glad that you're here. If by chance you are first time worshiper at Federated, then I'm excited that you're here. Would love to meet you at the end of the service. I have a gift that I would like to give you if you will come out into the foyer and make your acquaintance and we'll get to know each other just a little bit. For the rest of you who are here each week, thank you for being here and I'm excited that you are here. I want to also just say welcome to those who are tuning in uh, by way of our website. We, we film this service and then it goes out and is archived and people all over the place tune in at various times and check out what's going on here at Federated. So last week, we, uh, we celebrated 100 years of God's faithfulness to this ministry. We met over in the big room and had a great time. And uh, there are many things that go into building a weekend like we had. And uh, we had a, a big celebration on Saturday night and then the service on Sunday with a lot of extra and special uh, aspects to it and the picnic afterwards, which got rained out. But nonetheless, we were able to hold it anyway in the church building and we had a great time. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of details have to be dealt with. And I just wanted the church to know who it was that spent almost a year uh, working to plan that out. So I'm just going to read their names to you very quickly. And we're just going to uh, recognize uh, those who gave so much to, uh, to make that weekend a success. Uh, John Porter was uh, leading the effort along with Mike and Mary Tesser and Bob Wells and Lamar and Priscilla Myers, Jennifer Stark, Maribel Kersey, Paul and Peg Olson, uh, Brandon and Ashley Kaufman, Dan and Marjorie Kennedy, and Ann Brown. So uh, if any of you are in this room or if you know them, let's give them a round of applause and thank them for their work. Today, I am focusing on the goodness of God. So if you brought a Bible, turn to Psalm chapter 100. Another way of saying that would be to say turn to song number 100 because the Psalms were Israel's hymn book. And so this is Psalm number 100. Let's read through and then we'll see what it has to say to us today. Psalm 100 says, shout with joy to Jehovah Yahweh. You probably don't see Jehovah Yahweh in your scripture. I've added that because when you go back to the original Hebrew, which this was written in, the word Lord isn't there. That's an English word that was plugged in, and I'm not going to explain why, but you'll actually find uh, the word Jehovah, Yahweh, one of those two, depending on how you pronounce it, I just put the two together. It's the personal name of God. So the word Lord, which means master, is not really there, but actually the personal name of God. So it reads, shout with joy to Jehovah Yahweh all the earth. Worship Jehovah Yahweh with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that Jehovah Yahweh is God. He made or created us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for Jehovah Yahweh is good. His unfailing love continues forever, and his faithfulness continues to each generation. Oh, Lord God, this morning we, we do come into your presence, hopefully with praise and with thanksgiving recognizing that you are God and we are the creation of your hand. Today, as we look at Psalm 100, open our hearts and minds to the truths that David lays out here, cause us to naturally then begin to want to apply what we see, which would draw us to contemplate who you are and what you have done and would draw our hearts to worship you. And hopefully, as we see your greatness and we worship you, we'll be drawn to share that with others. So may this time that we spend this morning in your word and contemplating your goodness, may it bring encouragement to our hearts. May it draw those who are far from you uh, into your presence and into your saving grace is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Now this psalm is a psalm that uh, David wrote. David was the second king of Israel. David was a man of many talents. He was a warrior. He was uh, a writer of poems. I mean, he did so many different things. He was obviously a politician. He was a king, a ruler. But among his many talents, he was a songwriter. And he wrote about many different things. When you read through the Psalms, you'll find him at times writing because he's sad. And when he's sad, he is pouring out his heart to God. He is sharing his burdens with, with, with God. And sometimes he writes because he's mad. Somebody has done something to offend him or hurt him in a very deep and profound way. And we find then David uh, writing a song as a prayer asking God to judge his enemies. And so we find David writing under those circumstances, but more times than not, we find him writing with a heart filled with joy, a heart filled with worship, and that's what we find in Psalm 100. If you were to want to outline Psalm 100, which is a very short, very brief uh, little psalm, uh, there's really just two main points, and they're on the screen for you. I apologize, there's no note guide, so if you want to write this stuff down, certainly feel free to do so. But basically, it's a call to praise Jehovah Yahweh. We find that call in verses 1 through 3, and then a call to thank Him, which is found in verses 4 through 5. Now, I want to take a moment to just kind of talk with you about the difference between praise and thanksgiving. A lot of folks don't seem to grasp that there really is a major difference between the two. They're not the same. Uh, basically, we praise God for who He is. That means we are looking then at His character. We're looking at His nature. We are, are looking at His attributes. We are looking at the things which make Him the being that He is and recognizing the quality of who he is, and out of that recognition then we offer worship, we offer praise that is completely based upon just simply who God is as a being. He is holy, he is just, he is loving, he is kind, he is gentle. I mean, there's so many attributes, so many character points, but that's what praise is. Thanksgiving, on the other hand, uh, comes from recognizing what he has done for us. And so we, we can all understand that God has done many things. He provides for us. He protects us. He heals us. He, he forgives us. So many things God has actively done on our behalf, and when we recognize those things, then we are to offer thanksgiving to God. And so David tells us in this psalm to praise and to thank God. Let's just look at it very quickly. He, he, he specifically tells us in, in verse 3 that we are to praise God because he is the creator. Notice in, in verse 3 he says that it is he, Jehovah Yahweh, it is the Lord who has made us and not we ourselves. Now, you know, I've seen that verse many, many times, and I've often, when I read it, thought that it was talking about creation in general. God has created all of us in general. Obviously, we didn't create ourselves, and, and that works, and that's good. But most likely, the context of verse 3 is that David is looking at Israel and Israel's creation and, 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 and praising God as the creator of Israel. It, it doesn't really matter which point it is because either way it works. The Bible tells us that God created mankind in general by scooping up the dust of the earth and forming a body and breathing into that man the breath of life and therefore God is the creator of us in general. But then the Bible also says that among that creation one day God chose a man, Abraham, and he made a covenant with Abraham and said, Abraham I will build out of you a brand new race, a brand new nation, and I will bless you and you will be a blessing to the whole earth. And so whether David is focusing on that or focusing on creation in general, it stands as true nonetheless that we should praise God for no other reason than the fact that he is the life-giving power source of all that is. He is the creator. But then in verse 4, we find David directing our attention to uh, offering God 
thanksgiving. And he tells us why. I mean, if we were to really list all of the reasons to be thankful to God, we would probably be here for weeks and weeks and weeks listing all the various things that God does. But, but David breaks it down to two things, and those two things are found in verse 5. He, he tells us to focus on God's goodness as it relates to his mercy, which endures forever, and upon his truth or his faithfulness, which endures to all generations. Now let's talk for just a moment about God's mercy. Do you know what mercy is? Mercy is a specific thing. Mercy is this. It is the withholding of judgment from one who deserves to be judged. That's mercy. And you know, all of us have sinned against God. Romans 3.23 says that we have all fallen short of his glory. And you know, on a daily basis, I'm sure there are things that we do that offend a holy God. And yet, he is merciful to us. The scripture tells us not only is he merciful to us who follow Jesus, but he's even merciful to those who are rejecting Jesus. Now, he won't be merciful to them forever. But in this age in which they're living right now, he is being merciful to them. Jesus said in one of the Gospels that God gives, causes the sun to rise and the rain to fall on the just and the unjust so that their crops grow, so their families are blessed, so that they can thrive. This then is an example of what is known as God's common grace. And it is an example of his mercy. We deserve his judgment, and yet God withholds that judgment. And those who follow Jesus, he withholds it forever, giving us mercy after mercy for all time. And so we should praise him for that. We should thank him for that. The second thing that he mentions is God's truth or faithfulness. Depending on the version of the Bible you have, one version may say we are to thank him for his truth. The other says for his faithfulness. And someone may say, well, that seems like a contradiction. Those aren't the same thing. And yet they really are. Because when, when David talks about God's truth here or his faithfulness, he's talking about God's truthfulness in the fact that when God makes a promise, he always fulfills it. And when you're looking at truth from that perspective, then you're talking about someone's faithfulness. And here's something that we can take to the bank, church, is that not one of God's promises ever falls by the wayside. Never. He may not fulfill his promise in a moment that we would like to see it fulfilled. It may be fulfilled many years, generations, or perhaps, as in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh, centuries or millennia. But he will fulfill his promises. He is faithful. He is faithful. And so David saw God's mercy. And, God, and David saw God's faithfulness as things that God had poured out in his life. And so he writes this song and he encourages those who read it or who hear it to also uh, worship the Lord, to praise him for who he is, and to recognize the many benefits that he has given us and so then, to thank him. Now I'd have to believe that in a room that has got many folks who know Jesus as Savior and Lord, that we would have many points of understanding about who God is, that we could worship him and praise him, and many understandings of what he is doing in and through us that would cause us to give him thanks. And I just want to encourage you to be people who daily, when you commune with God, to take the time, not just to ask him for stuff, but to worship him, to focus on who he is as a being, to lay out the many benefits that you're aware of, of how he is blessing you and taking care of you and honoring you, and to give him thanks for that, because it is right and it is proper to do that. Now, I carry us through Psalm 100 to focus on the goodness of God because we are today, this Sunday, we are, we are as a church entering the second century of ministry uh, as a church. And we are the generation that gets to cross over from one era of time to a new era of time. I know I say that word a little bit strange. I had someone try to coach me on how to say it better, but I'm just going to stick with my West Virginia way of saying it and just say era, okay? And you know I'm talking about a period of time. 
As I said last week at our 100th anniversary celebration, the first 100 years of God's working with First Federated Church, that has gone under the bridge. That era is gone. It's never coming back. We can occasionally look at it, thank God for some good things he did, and there's some probably other things that we did we'd just like to say, well, I'll just forget about that. We won't think about those things, all right? But that time is gone. We are faced with a brand new era, and we are faced with a brand new mission and a brand new vision. And just as God was good to us then, he will continue to be good to us today. And that is what I really want to point out to us today. But there's something else that I want to make sure that we as a church grasp and that you hear from my mouth before we get too far into the new era, okay? And that is this. That there is something from the old era, there are two things specifically from the old era, that we are going to continue to maintain as part of the new era. We are not going to abandon these two things because they are things that are crucial to us being an effective church. What two things am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about these two things. The fact that Federated was founded upon the Word of God and it was founded with a centeredness on the Lord Jesus Christ. And those are two things that everybody in this community knows about Federated. If they know anything about us, they know that we are a biblically-based ministry. We are a Christ-centered ministry. We have been that for 100 years, and we're going to continue being that for however long God allows us to live, or at least as long as he allows me to be the pastor here. I'm going to fight for those things because those are things that are crucial to our future success. We're going to maintain those. Why are those so important? I've told you they're important, but why are they important? Number one, well, they are important because the Bible is God's revelation to us. The Bible is God's revelation to us. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, if you'll put the scripture on the screen, tells us that God's word is here to teach us what is true. It is here to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It is here to correct us when we're wrong and to teach us to do right. And the word of God is God's mechanism to prepare and to equip his people to do every good work. We cannot afford to go into this new era thinking that we can somehow improve on what God has given us. We cannot. And therefore, it must remain our foundation. But we also need to ensure that we're keeping our focus centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the scripture teaches us he is the head of the church. It is by his blood that we have become a church. And that's what Colossians chapter 1 verses 18 through 20 says. It says that Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. He was the first one. So he is the first in everything, for God in all of his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And so one of the things you can count on, Federated, as we move into the new era is that we will not abandon our basis on the scripture and our centeredness on Jesus. If anything, we're going to promote those harder and more because they are ever true and they are ever right. But as we move into this new era, there is a third foundational reality that we must work together to ensure that this third aspect becomes as much a part of our DNA as Bible-based and Christ-centered are. And that third aspect I spoke about last week, but I'm speaking about it again, and that is to become community-focused. Now let me say that in our history, we've had times of being community-focused. You'd, a person would be ignoring history if they said that were not, was not true of Federated ever. It has been, but it's not been true consistently. We've had times when it was and times when it wasn't. We've always consistently remained center, uh, based on the Bible. We've always remained consistently focused upon Christ, but not necessarily focused in our community. And so that has to become that third piece that never ever wavers. Let me talk about community focused in this way. It's it's really just another way of saying becoming inside out. Having our drive and our focus upon 
others, not on ourselves. Now you know that the mission and vision that we've been talking about comes out of the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. And when you read the Great Commandment and Great Commission, you know instinctively, just by looking at the words, that it demands an outward focus. You cannot live the Great Commandment and you cannot live the Great Commission and be focused on yourself. We cannot do that as an organization. We must be outwardly focused. Uh, We are to what? Love others as we love ourselves. We are to make disciples of all the nations. The only way that can happen is when we allow the love and the grace and the mercy of God that he has showered upon us to be turned outward in an attempt to help others experience that like we've experienced it. And that's what being community focused is all about. Now, I'll, I'll be the first to admit to you that being community-focused is, is, is usually not easy, and it's not convenient. And the reason is because it, we have to fight against our own selfish, old sin nature to do it, right? And so it becomes an internal struggle as much as anything. And yet, it is the reason we exist. Are you listening to me this morning? It is the reason we exist. We, God has left us here and provided for us here. And, 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 and he keeps us here to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ and ambassadors of his gospel to this community. There's no other reason for us to be here. And so community focus must be part of the triad of who we are. Now, I have to tell you that I'm extremely encouraged and I'm very pleased that Federated is beginning to show signs of moving into that mindset of being community focused. And I want to take some time in the message today to celebrate these initial wins of of, of ourselves kind of coming out of ourselves and beginning to show that we have a heart or that we're willing to develop a heart or that we're willing to follow leadership in becoming community focused. Uh, focused. And I'm going to do that by sharing two recent wins with you as it relates to ministry because this is so exciting to me and and I'm so proud of this. I want to start by talking to you about a ministry we did just recently called Upward Basketball. It was a camp that we did. Uh, We're giving a lot of consideration to adopting as part of our ministry mix what is known as Upward Basketball Ministries for Children. And uh, some of you don't even know what that is so let me explain what it is. Upward Basketball is a ministry, it's a parachurch ministry, which means it, it, it doesn't belong to any one particular church, it's that churches of all kind can get involved in it. But it's a ministry that combines uh, the, the teaching of, of basketball fundamentals to, to elementary age children with discipleship mentoring, trying to move them toward faith in Jesus Christ. And this is for elementary age boys and girls. How does that work? Well... Um, here's how it works. And and my kids were involved in this in Ohio years ago. Um, Every week, the teams that are formed, they have a weekly practice. Now, the coaches are to be born-again believers. And and at the practice, they, they teach them all the fundamentals and they practice it, but they have a little break time. And when they have that break time, that's when they have a devotional time and they talk about Jesus and they talk about the gospel. I think there's even a booklet that the children get and they do lessons throughout the week. Another thing that uh, Upward does is that on Saturday when they have the ball games, right, when all day long there's, there's teams after teams playing and at the halftime when the little kids are off getting a drink and going to the potty, right, the parents are sitting there on the, on, on the bleachers with nothing else to do. So guess what? They schedule a speaker to come in and talk to them from the Bible to talk about Jesus, to talk about salvation, to talk about God's grace, to talk about uh, the goodness of God. I mean, you've got a captive audience there, and, and, and many of the parents, they're not Christians. They might not be churchgoers, but they find the program helpful to their children, and so they, they have them involved, and they come to see, and they're a captive audience, and so there you go. You have an opportunity to share the gospel, and it's a great opportunity. Now, so, but rather than just jump in and say, we're going to do it, we, we tested it, right? We did a week's camp, and, and, and here's what 
we uh, found after the one week. Here's some of the wins. I just want to share them with you so that you can rejoice uh, as we're rejoicing. We had 51 kids register for uh, the, 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 the week's camp. I think that's a win. 25 of those kids were not from Federated. They were from the community. That's an even better win. 13 of the 25 have no church home whatsoever. They're coming from unchurched families, and all 13 of those families come from the 1011 window. That's a triple win, as far as I'm concerned, because that's exactly who we're wanting to go after. Now, in this camp, not only did we have coaches and helpers from Federated, but we were able to actually connect with some coaches, coaches and speakers from Drake and from, um, uh, from uh, Grandview University. Were they Christians or not? I don't know. I didn't meet them. But if they weren't, that's even a better win because now we're drawing in adults to help us with this, and they're hearing the same thing the kids are hearing. And that is an awesome, awesome win. Some of the responses that we got back from the adults. Listen to this. There was a, a federated coach who made a connection with one of the fathers. And this father is coming, uh, is, is, is a Catholic. He's coming from a Catholic background. And he's noticing some very distinctive differences about uh, the teaching. And, and so he is curious and he began to connect and, and want to know more about that. That's a win. That's an open door. Right, Tracy Grease over here, who we're going to recognize in just a few minutes, she made a connection with a mom who had questions about organized religion. Now, you know, I've, I'm instructed Tracy to make sure the woman doesn't find out that we do disorganized religion here at Federated. But that's the I mean, you know, that's the only way she knew how to talk about, you know, religion. Well, we're not about religion; we're about a relationship with Jesus. But you know what? She's going to be following up on that, and we're going to be having that conversation. Uh, another father indicated on his evaluation form that he was unsure about his relationship with Jesus. That's a win. He just opened the door, and we're going to follow up with that to talk to him how he can be sure. Uh, Another thing that we did with all the children and their families was make sure that we let them know of other ministries that are coming up. We invited them to the splash party. Now, whether we're going to get to do that today or not, I don't know. But we've invited them to Vacation Bible School, told them about our, our Sunday school, told them about our Awana program. That's a win. Finally, one woman from the community took the time to actually write a, an email and share with us her thoughts. And I thought I would read that to you today because I think this is definitely a win. Here's what this mother has to say. Just wanted to take a minute to say thank you for the great week of camp for my boys. They absolutely loved every day of it. And, and, and I couldn't believe how much my oldest grew in his confidence of the game and skill in such a short time. So fun to watch the scrimmage last night. We have been involved in other leagues and have found that upward activities are such a wonderful and refreshing variation. The Christian base uh, to it provides a safer, more accepting environment that, that my special needs son and my normally shy younger son ha have thrived in. And, and I also appreciate the male role models that the boys were able to work with this past week. I'm not done yet reading, but can you see the win? Can you see the appreciation? We opened up, we focused outward, we drew in, and look at the result. This is awesome. She goes on to write, so thanks for all your hard work. Your efforts did not go unnoticed. We are very pleased and we hope uh, that you will be holding the camp again next year. Um, I'll watch uh, for, I'm reading without my glasses, by the way. Uh, I, I, I'll watch for the boys to, uh, to bring home another flyer from Monroe Elementary School with that announcement next year. I think that's a win. That's a win, that's a win, that's a win. And did you hear that last sentence? Did you catch what that last sentence said? I'll be looking for a church flyer to come home with my boys from a secular school. Hey, the, the public school is allowing us to promote the ministry through them. If that ain't a win, I don't know what else is. That's awesome. Amen? Amen. That's great. That is great. And I'm excited about that. And so uh, I asked Tracy to come in. Now, Tracy's not the only one who held the camp, but she was the leadership. She was the, the organizer. She was the behind kicker to make sure everything was getting done. And, 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 and you did a great job, Tracy, and I thank you. I want you to stand up, and let's give her uh, a recognition for that. You know... 
so many other volunteers were just as pleased and just as happy with them. But that group, they loved God by loving others, and they took steps to disciple young lives toward the faith. That's where we're going. That's what we have to be at all times. That's ministry. So I'm so grateful for that. There's another thing I want to share with you very quickly, and that is yesterday's canvassing of our community uh, in, in lieu of our Vacation Bible School uh, that is coming up. It was a great win as well. I'm going to talk about some specifics there. But before I do, let me show you a little video that Dustin put together. He went out and did some filming. And, and if you weren't able to go, then you can kind of get a vision for what it was like. And if you were out there knocking on doors, all you could see what you were doing, you can see now what others were doing. Let's take a moment and look at it here on the screen. some of the details that have come back my way. Now, you know I was calling for 500, and sadly we didn't see 500, but thankfully we saw the largest number of Federites ever to march into Canaan at one time to do a work for God. We had 250 who came out, and I'm excited about that. I think that's a great win. That's a great win. 250 going out in one mass effort together. That was a win. Uh, the 10-11 window I've been talking about, we had to divide that up into 45 sectors. That was the way that we went about trying to break it down. Because we didn't have the 500, we weren't able to get to all 45 areas, but we got to 37. And so that's almost there. And so we got to the lion's share of it. Some of the winds that God gave us, he gave us great weather. you know. And we've been under this deluge of rain, and we had the perfect break at just the right time. You can call it a coincidence. I think it's an answer to prayer because we were asking God for it. You know, we had teams coming back with all kinds of great reports. Some of the things that were said, I mean, these are just the common things that were said. People were coming back saying, wow, the folks out there were nice to us, as though they were expecting to be beaten up or something. It wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. And you know, that's an interesting comment because I, I went, uh, it was me and Jerry DeGan, we were partners, and if you know Jerry, and uh, as we were walking out the door, he, he looks at me and he says, Pastor Mike, I just want you to know this is way above my comfort level, as though what he was saying was, oh, you're probably just an old pro, and this is hard for me, but it's probably easy for you. I looked at him and I said, Jerry, it's above my comfort level too. This is easy to get up here and do this, but to go marching up on somebody's front door, I don't know, and knock on the door and try to engage him in conversation, that's hard. For me, And so we both uh, were above our heads and, and the comfort level. But you know, both he and I and many others uh, said after those few initial knocks, the anxiety level came down and it became natural. It became much easier. As we went to the community, many people in the community actually thanked our people for being out there. 
They were excited to see a local church canvassing an area. Uh, one, one parent indicated to one of our canvassers, I've been looking for a vacation Bible school to send my kids to. Uh, guess what? They've got now a personal visit and invitation. I'll bet we'll see their kid here. Another parent came to the door, and after they found out that the folks on their step was from First Federated Church, they said, you're not going to believe this. You're going to think I'm making this up. But we were just on the computer looking at First Federated Church's website, reviewing your ministries to see what you had for our kids. Is that a divine appointment or what? You know, some say, well, we don't have kids anymore, but what do you have this ministry or that ministry? or What can you offer uh, our community from this perspective? We ran into some Christians who said, well, we go to another church, but I'll tell you what, we'll keep the flyer and we'll pray for you guys while you minister to the kids on that week. Man, that's a win. And this one was really cool. I was sitting after it was all over with, I was back home eating lunch, and I got a text. And it said, we just got our first online registration from the 50310 zip code from Adams Street. So someone had been visited they had looked it over, and they had already registered their kids that afternoon. And that's, that's a win. That's something to celebrate. And you know, again, so many volunteers, so many folks who did various things to make yesterday's canvassing a success, and I'm grateful, and I'm proud of, and I'm thankful for every one of you. But I do want to recognize two in particular, and that is Scott Hamilton and Bill Lowen. Scott Hamilton is one of our elders. Bill's just a member here. He plays in the band sometimes, plays piano. But both of them took weeks, had various meetings. They're the ones who broke everything down in military precision, created all the maps so we would know exactly where to go, covered all the details. And, and, you know, and Scott labored under the weight of his father passing away. And I would have been fully, I would have understood if he just said, I, I can't continue on. But he kept right on serving regardless because he knew how important this was. And I am so thankful to them and to you. And I'm proud of each and every one of you that went. So thank you so much for making yesterday a success. And that's just another win. And so here we are, barely one week into the new era, one week into the new century, and we're already seeing God at work and we're seeing him be faithful but I want to change I want to change the view here for a second from the church to you personally and, and I want to ask you has God been good to you he's been good to federated he's been more than generous with us as an organization as his body as his church but what about you personally are you aware of his goodness you know I'm sure that you are but if you're like me, oftentimes we get so busy with life that we tend to forget. And we tend to let those opportunities to worship him and to thank him go by. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you to take some time this week and to reflect on who God is. Not what he's done. I'm, do not, I'm not asking you what he, but who he is. He is your creator. He is your redeemer. He is holy. He is just. You know, those kinds of character traits. And allow the wonder of who he is to fill your heart. And, and, and just worship him. Thank him for being who he is. But then take the time to also think about what he's done. How has he blessed you? Has he provided for you? Has he forgiven you? Has he healed you? Has he, you name it. And then offer him thanksgiving and praise for the work that he is doing in and on your behalf. And I have to believe that as we focus on the Lord and we see him for who he is, and we look at all that he is doing in our lives and we thank him for what he has done, that could only drive us then to want to share that good news with other people. It could only turn us into impassioned ambassadors of the gospel in Jesus Christ because we would want others to experience that same blessing and goodness that we've experienced. And that's what I'm hoping that we become, a church filled with ambassadors of the gospel. Today, you also may have come here today with a burden. There's something that's pressing on your life something that you don't let others know of in particular, but it's really been weighing on you, some issue. 
and you would like for someone to pray with you, I want you to know that each week now, when we come to the close of the service, we're going to have folks available to minister to you and, and who care and want to hear and are willing to pray for you. And today, the two people that we have are Greg Stearns, and normally, or today it was supposed to be Sean, uh, but uh, actually he had to trade off with Eric Trudeau. And so, uh, so Greg and Eric will be here at the front in just a minute, and, and, and they would love to, to, to meet you and hear and, and share with you and pray with you. And if you'd like to know what it means to follow Jesus, I would encourage you to take one of the booklets that we have in the pouch in the seat directly in front of you. It looks just like the one on the screen, and it'll talk about how you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ as well. I would encourage you to read it, and then let's connect about what it has to say. Father, I just thank you. I praise you. I worship you. And I thank you for your goodness to us. You are my creator. You are my sustainer. You are my God, my Lord, my Father. You are holy. You are righteous. You are just. You are merciful. You are loving. You are kind and you are gentle. I worship you, Lord, for who you are. And I thank you for the multiplicity of things that would take hours for me to express. For 54 years of giving me life and giving me breath, giving me a home and a family and friends and health, and providing for my, for my needs. Oh, God, you are so good. And you've been so good to Federated. Thank you for that. May we not become a people who take for granted all of your blessings. But may we, may we rejoice in them daily. And may that rejoicing drive us to be passionate ambassadors of Jesus Christ and his gospel. Lord, may we see more wins like this of our church focusing on the community and seeing folks come to faith, seeing lives transformed and changed in the days to come. May you be lifted up and may others be benefited by your mercies and your grace. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Danny.